so, so everybody this is Thomas I'll just give him a minute to get himself ready uh, he's with us at MTRI he's our resident fishing guy uh, looking at invasive species uh, and today we're talking about diverse perspectives um, in fishing uh, is local and international um, so thank you so much for your patience everybody you're wonderful um, yeah and I'll, I'll give it over to you are you ready I'm all set. Uh, can everybody see my screen or do I need to share that again? Share it, yes. Yes, let's do it one more time. All right, everyone seeing that? Yes. Perfect. What technical troubles? We're going. Oh, here we are, amazing. <laughs> all right, just put a little timer on my phone because I, I ran through this once and I went way over time. Um, yeah. Thank you for the intro. I will jump right in. Uh, my name is Thomas. Thank you very much for your patience. I've been having trouble with my mic all day. Uh, it appears to be working now, so uh, fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be doing this. Uh, when Jane first asked if I might be able and willing to contribute a presentation, I said, sure, what project do you want me to talk about? Um, I followed up with Emma and Emma said, whatever you find interesting. So that was her first mistake. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is something that's kind of been on the periphery of a uh, work I've been doing, but this is by no means something I researched thoroughly. This is not a PhD presentation, anything like that. Uh, and when Emma asked for a title, I said uh, maybe how the word uh, recreational fishery has changed, how it's updated and evolved. Uh, and that still sounded pretty academic, so I've just added a subtitle, uh, AKA a couple fish stories with the occasional fact. Uh, a lot of this will be anecdotal, I think it's still valuable, and uh, I also just wanna say early on, I think there's on Zoom, there's an option to like raise hands, so please interrupt me if we're all in the room. Uh, this will be a lot more fun to just people throw in, but if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, uh, I can see that someone wants to say something and then uh, you can hop on in. Otherwise, if you would be on mute so we just don't hear too much going on in the background, that would be helpful. So to jump right in, I should explain a little bit about my background uh, and why I'm talking about this. So I've been lucky enough to have lived in a couple different places. Uh, I did my undergrad out in BC. Uh, I focused on marine biology uh, and did an honors thesis on Pacific salmon migrations. Uh, while there, I did an exchange in Morocco where it was mostly sustainable resource use. Uh, after graduating, I, I bounced around to a couple different things, but I ended up uh, doing an IEP internship through Memorial University, uh, where I worked in Malawi and also traveled around uh, the region uh, a little bit, uh, Mozambique, Zambia, uh, Tanzania. Uh, yeah, that's mostly it during that time. And lastly, this last summer, I worked internationally per uh, uh, a grant through uh, the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship to go to St. Vincent and the Grenadines as well as a couple different countries in the Eastern and Southern Caribbean. That was mostly marine protected area work. But what I really wanted to talk about today and something I think is really fun is recreational fishing and how it looks in different jurisdictions. So while I've mostly focused on commercial fisheries and emerging fisheries, uh, I've gone everywhere with a fishing rod and I love fishing. And uh, it's also a growing field of academic research that used to be something that was mostly on the periphery but it's really evolved and expanded. Uh, on that note, in Canada, we classify fisheries into three broad categories, uh, commercial, recreational, and then what's known as FSC, which stands for uh, uh, yeah, food sustenance and ceremonial purposes, which are broadly under the category of indigenous fisheries. I'm just going to limit this conversation today to commercial and recreational because I do not know enough about indigenous fisheries, how they've changed and how they've evolved. But I did just want to put out a recommendation that if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, you should look up the Unamagi Institute. And this is very quick link to their website, especially Shelly Denny, uh, who's working on her PhD right now, but she's written a couple books and she's done a lot of research about how indigenous fisheries have co-evolved uh, alongside recreational and commercial fisheries. Uh, and uh, the Unamagi website also has a ton of really interesting uh, links to other indigenous resource use. Uh, websites and research. So with that in mind, I figured since this is fish stories, I should start with two fish stories that are personal to me that I think are kind of interesting and 
if I were to go back to school, this would be the foundation of a research question. I don't plan on going back to school for a very long time, if ever, but things I find fascinating. And the first is a story from when I was in Malawi. Uh, I was working in an aquaculture department there and everyone I worked with were, was local Malawian and I became friends with a couple folks and we went on vacation together to the north of the country and working in an aquaculture department, you talk about fish and fishing all the time. That is the break room discussion of choice. And needless to say, I didn't understand Malawian fishing and my coworkers didn't understand the Canadian approach to fishing at all either. Uh, when we got to the north of the province, we, uh, I took out a fly rod, uh, went fishing with some friends. Uh, they were staying on the bank and laughing at me uh, because fly fishing was very funny to them. Uh, about 20 times, uh, my, my coworker must have said, do you want us to go get you a net? Because it seems very inefficient. Uh, eventually, I hooked into what is called a mpongo, which is a very large species of river catfish. And a great time, uh, lots of high fives, get a picture with it, and then I released it, which was almost instinctual for me. And I got an earful. Uh, and the way my friend uh, described it to me afterwards, he's like, if this is like com coming to my birthday party, uh, baking me a wonderful cake, and then throwing it on the ground. and uh, that, that really stuck with me because I grew up uh, spending the summers in Ontario, family cottage, mostly catch and release fishing. It's very much a, a way of life. Uh, and we had talked about uh, at work uh, how overfished Lake Malawi was. That was something we were all agreed on. So I thought that would be a no brainer. Well, also being Canadian, we don't eat catfish that often. So I threw it back. But Malawi is a very food insecure nation. Um, and it is still developing and there's a lot of subsistence agriculture. So it wasn't just a bit of a faux pas, it's actually quite offensive to release a fish. Uh, and so that was something I kind of had in mind and I, I started to rethink how we view recreational angling. And the follow-up to that was this last summer I was working in St. Vincent for uh, an NGO called Sustainable Grenadines. And I had a really wonderful chat with my boss, uh, Richard Joseph, and Fishing is very is very much a recreational leisure act, uh, pastime in the South and Eastern Caribbean, and but it was still a different approach. And the way she explained it to me, why recreational fishing in uh, St. Vincent and the Eastern Caribbean was quite controversial, is that it often represented a legacy of colonialism. So we were working with protected area management, uh, marine protected parks, and most of those were established uh, by colonial governments, either the English, the French, or the Dutch, where we were. And they were not set up to protect biodiversity or ecosystems, but to provide avenues for recreation for tourists in an area where the primary livelihood is fishing. And so this was very much seen, uh, one of the things we were working on is an uphill battle because protected areas have that stigma with them because they were founded with the intention of excluding local people. So, and recreational fishing was still very much viewed in that light, depending on how you went about it. Uh, I would go out every day with my coworkers with hand lines, but it was considered very offensive to go out, catch a tuna, and release a tuna on a sailboat. So, I, I just want to share those two stories to say that it's a very nuanced uh, and complicated issue, depending on where you are. And there's a lot of culture that goes into the conversation of recreational fisheries. And before I make it sound like this is a developed nation versus less developed nation dilemma, uh, I have a quick little video uh, from Germany where the Germans have a very, let's see if this will let me open it, a very different attitude towards recreational fishing than we do. There we go. Sorry, I was staring at my computer. But. Uh, I'll just preface this video, it always has an ad block thing first, by saying in Germany it's illegal to fish without a purpose. That's actually the wording of the law. Uh, if you are fishing, you must have a purpose to fish. And so this video was made, uh, it's through Outside Magazine, by a group of recreational anglers that are trying to push for the right to do more catch and release fishing. As it stands, it's currently illegal. So if you fish, I think you might find this interesting, just comparing the fight that they're having to what fishing looks like in Canada. And it has subtitles. Uh, let me know if you can A, hear it and if the subtitles are large enough. 
it's still, uh, when you're showing your screen, it's still just showing the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, Can I'll just leave it. I've dealt with enough. I want us to be able to see, I'm gonna exit full screen. Um, that, that's okay, because it's only like a two minute video. Um, I can, and I've dealt with enough technology not working with me today that, oh, yeah. I just opened it again, back to where I meant to. Yeah, uh, what that video was supposed to show uh, was the uphill battle that a couple fly fishermen have trying to be allowed to practice catch and release fishing. And the reason I find it so interesting is you have the German government saying, you know, you can't do that. And currently we have programs in Nova Scotia encouraging catch and release fishing. Uh, you have free license days where you don't need a, a license to fish. You have learn to fish activities. Um, sorry, we have lots of chat things coming up. Oh, from Nicole. Uh, yeah, we have learn to fish programs. We have, uh, all sorts of incentives, trying to get more people to fish and especially to release their fish. So it's just very different. Uh, and that context, go ahead, Emma, sorry. Just, you know, I'm physically raising my hand. Um, also other people, there's like, tw there's 12 people here. You can put your video on if you want. There's, uh, it's, yeah, we can have a chat. Um, but yeah, Nicole says, if you reshare your screen with a new view of the website, like once you have gone to the website and then you reshare your screen, then we should be able to see it. Okay. Maybe I'll leave that till the end. Nice, yeah. Just, uh, yeah, because it also kicks me out of PowerPoint every time I do that. Uh, and frankly, there's some more stories coming up that I find a bit more fun that aren't my stories. So with that, I was just going to say, uh, one of the big reasons that we have a different outlook towards fishing in Canada than many other jurisdictions around the world goes back to the British attitudes towards fishing. And you can't find a better example of how those attitudes have evolved than one of my all-time favorite books, uh, The Complete Angler. It's gonna let me. So this was written in the 17th century by Isaac Walton. And it's where we first hear uh, the origins of the quote, gentleman fisher. Uh, that angling is something to be done for the aristocracy. You wear your Sunday best and you practice catch and release. Uh, it's chock full of great quotes. Uh, I have one written here. Rivers and the inhabitants of the watery elements are made for wise men to contemplate and for fools to pass by. It's essentially 200 pages of that. Um, some interesting comparisons come from uh, Isaac Walton explores how fishing is better than hunting because he compares it to otter hunters who when they kill a mother otter go and find all the baby otters to kill them too. It goes, well, in angling, I just hold the trout and then release the trout. And this is one of the first examples of sort of separating fishing for sport from fishing for food. And not just separating the two activities, but making it a bit of a class issue, if you will, it is seen as a sign of affluence to be able to go fishing and not need catch and keep your fish. Uh, and so that's evolved quite a bit, but there is still a bit of that notion that's alive. Uh, but I wanted to ground this presentation back in how recreational fishing has changed and evolved in Nova Scotia specifically. And I think there's no better example than the story of the Principality of Outer Baldonia. Uh, are people familiar with this? Just a thumbs up, thumbs down or everyone has their video off. Okay, I was just on another call where I brought this up and uh, no one had come across this either, which makes me sad because this is one of my favorite pieces of Nova Scotian history. So in the 1950s, uh, bluefin tuna were incredibly abundant off the south coast of Nova Scotia, uh, not too far from Tuscot. And uh, American gentleman uh, decided that he was tired of driving his boat very far, multiple nautical miles every day to go out to prime fishing grounds. For, so for about $700, uh, I looked it up, it's about uh, $5,500 a today. He bought uh, an island that's about 10 square kilometers called Outer Bald Island. And I'm sure a fair amount of whiskey was involved before that island declared independence from Canada and the United States. And what I find even more funny is that the Nova Scotian government accepted. Now, this is the Declaration of Independence from the Principality of Outer Baldonia, 
Let these facts be submitted to a candid world, that fishermen are a race alone, that fishermen are endowed with the following inalienable rights, the right of freedom from question, nagging, shaving, interruption, women, taxes, politics, wars, monologues, a bit ironic, can't, and inhibitions, the right to swear, lie, drink, gamble, the right to sleep all day and stay up all night. Now, therefore, we bond ourselves into a new nation, forever independent of all other nations, and do establish on the islands and waters of Outer Bald Island a new government which shall be forever respected and recognized as the Principality of Outer Bald Island. So, one, I love that story because I find it very funny, uh, but it kind of goes to show, one, how abundant fish were, how big the fishing community was, uh, and this became a running joke. It is actually now a bird observatory. It was donated in the 1970s for $1. Um, but it's a good comparison of how recreational fishing has evolved from the 1950s to today in Nova Scotia. Uh, all you have to do is look up what it takes to fish for a bluefin tuna recreationally. So this is just a screenshot uh, from the NAFO uh, uh, management plan for bluefin tuna, which is a very long, complicated document, but it is an excellent example of bureaucracy and red tape. To catch a bluefin tuna takes months of preparation to be a guide uh, and then to release it. There is a commercial bluefin uh, tuna fishery as well, but in order to catch and release a tuna, you have to go with an organized charter. Charters are very closely regulated uh, or have a commercial license. And so for the cost of an island uh, adjusted for inflation today, you could get about two days on the average price of uh, two days of a bluefin charter at today's money. So it's a very fast growing industry and the bluefin is an extreme example. They're uh, enormous and very valuable fish, but it goes to show how fast things can change in half a century. And with that in mind, I wanted to move on a little bit to just how our definitions of recreation have changed. So Isaac Walton, in his perfect image of the, quote, gentleman angler, uh, to what we have labeled under DFO and um, inland fisheries definitions of recreational fishing in Nova Scotia. So I like to call it a nice little game. Is this a sport? Catching a brown trout. Pretty straightforward. It's probably what Isaac Walton in the early 1600s imagined uh, as the true sporting uh, activity. Uh, but it gets a little more complicated when you get to smelt. This is a picture from the West Coast, but it's pretty common on the, uh, in Nova Scotia as well. I just couldn't find as, as nice of pictures from the archives. Uh, yeah, dipping nets into moving water to collect smelt. Not quite the same idea, but a very common practice in this province. And then you get a little more muddled when you get to clam digging, incredibly popular in Nova Scotia, managed as a quote, recreational activity, uh, probably not what we think of as a sport. So we have never fully adopted the idea that recreational fishing is purely the 1600s uh, British aristocracy version of wearing your Sunday best and catch and releasing trout. There is a wide umbrella of things that we consider recreational angling. So in modern day Canada, uh, commercial and recreational fisheries have changed a lot. These statistics I'm about to throw out are from 2016, so they have changed quite a bit since. Uh, the commercial industry, uh, the commercial fishing industry accounts for $6.6 .6 billion in exports alone, so that's not even domestic markets. Uh, interestingly enough, over 2 billion of that is from lobster fishing alone. Uh, approximately 72,000 Canadians rely directly on fishing as a source of income. Uh, that's not taking into account the smaller economies that revolve around fishing villages and towns. And recreational, we have a primarily older age demographic that spend quite a bit of money. Uh, it's about 1.6 billion of direct expenditure for fishing by residents in Canada. And that number is probably very undervalued uh, as it's difficult to measure exactly how much money gets spent on fishing. Uh, you could just take people's price tags when they go to Cabela's, but realistically people go on fishing trips, they stay in hotels, they, um, they buy food, they, they get accommodation, uh, they hire guides. So this is just measuring guiding fishing, only fishing lodges 
and uh, by the, the purchase of fishing equipment. So the, the actual numbers uh, for contributions to the economy is probably quite a bit larger. And the average expenditure just on fishing gear guides and uh, lodging per year by, by the average angler is $650. And we might scoff at that a little bit in Nova Scotia, thinking that's really high for recreational angling. Uh, and I have some good news. Maritimers spend the least amount of money, but catch the most fish. I think that's a very proud uh, title. Uh, in Creole censuses, uh, if you go to Newfoundland and you watch people jigging uh, with steel wire on a stick and catching fish like that, it'll make a lot of sense. Some other important things to consider regarding the difference today between commercial and recreational fishing. Uh, commercial fishing is regulated and monitored quite heavily. And I imagine some of you will probably scoff at that idea because commercial fishing is often a contentious uh, topic, especially in Nova Scotia, but I will come back to it. And commercial fishing is driven by economic forces primarily. Uh, the term in fisheries management is maximum economic yield. So if the price per pound of chosen species is quite high, you will probably see a high effort. It's worth the gas money to go and put in a lot of time to get those fish. And effort will change based on market forces quite easily. And I know I mentioned it's over 70,000 people, but per capita, it's not that many people who are directly involved in wild capture fisheries anymore. Uh, but they have quite a large impact on our ecosystems and our economy. In recreational fishing, I just want to start off by saying that things are changing. So we have a lot of research coming out. And I mentioned earlier, this is a growing field, but attitudes, perceptions, and how people fish are constantly developing. And there's some really interesting things coming out. Uh, older generations are not fishing as much. The average age of an angler I mentioned before is 46 years old, but we are seeing a lot of baby boomers who are giving up the sport and we're not seeing as many young people take it up. But those who are taking it up seem to have a wide array of beliefs, perceptions, and practices. A uh, really fascinating article about young people taking up fishing uh, came to the assertion that younger people were doing it more as part of the farm-to-table food movement, not as a sport, but rather a way of sourcing fish locally and sustainably. Uh, recreational fishing also isn't driven by market forces in the same way. So if you don't have great salmon fishing uh, in Cape Breton, or you're not allowed to retain salmon in Cape Breton, which is the case, uh, you economic forces, if they applied uh, rationally, you would go to the grocery store and buy your fish because it's not worth it to go to New Brunswick to catch your fish. That's not how it works in recreational fishing. People are not fishing for the purpose of price per pound for their fish. They're looking for experiences. They're more willing to spend a long time to go a lot further and access new areas. Also not driven by efficiency. Uh, the mere existence of fly fishing goes to prove this. There are fast ways of catching fish and then there are popular ways of catching fish. And this is something that complicates the issue when we don't really know exactly how uh, most people are fishing. We do our best and there's a lot of survey work, but as I mentioned before, it's always changing. Another interesting fact is that our recreational fisheries are highly targeted. So uh, the example I wanted to use for this is Pacific halibut on the West Coast, uh, managed in a co-management scheme between Canada and the US. Uh, halibut allowances are anywhere between one and five fish a day for recreational licenses per person. Uh, well, there are some areas with absolutely zero retention or catch and release fishing. Uh, and the way that people catch these halibut is very different than you might imagine. You're only, if you're only allowed one fish a day, there's a good chance that if you're catching fish, you're gonna be catching and releasing about 15 if you're in a productive area. The reason being, you're gonna try and keep scaling it up. You wanna catch the big fish to go home when you only have one, unlike a commercial longliner that's gonna take what it can get. So, and commercial are often uh, managed by the pound or the ton. So, when you only get one fish or two fish, or you're limited in which ones you can take out, you're going for big fish. And those big fish are often highly fecund females. So you do have a large ecological impact. They reckon that the total take in British Columbia for halibut is around 15% recreational to 85% um, commercial. 
However, those 15% are often very large breeding females. So the actual impacts are quite large. So recreational fishing, when I bring up that it used to be sort of a periphery to commercial management, it's a growing field because we're really starting to realize just how much recreational anglers can have an impact. Again. And I mentioned that commercial is closely monitored and heavily regulated, which I know might be a little bit controversial, but when you compare it to recreational, in Nova Scotia, you need to fill out a catch card anytime you buy a fishing license. It's given to you with your angler's handbook, uh, and at the end of the fishing season, you need to fill this out and send it back to the province. Uh, it's legally mandated, and I'm pretty sure there's even some wording there saying, you know, there are strict penalties for non-compliance. Uh, that data is actually analyzed by Trevor Avery at uh, Acadia University, and in talking with him, he mentioned that it's about a 3% return rate. So 97% of recreational anglers in Nova Scotia don't fill out these cards. So we don't have a great idea of what's going on with recreational uh, And it is a pretty significant portion of our population that goes out to fish. The Canada-wide average is just a little bit over 10%. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Newfoundland is quite a ways over 30%. What surprised me, this is again 2016 data, things might be changing, is it's just a bit over 5% for Nova Scotia. So we are having big impacts with our recreational fishing is the point I'm trying to make. And before I finish, because I think I'm already over 20 minutes or so, uh, I want to pick out a couple pieces of research that I find really fascinating that are saying what I'm saying, but with facts and data to back it up that I uh, first, this is just a uh, review paper that did a really good job of looking into the reasons people fish and how they fish and how those are evolving, uh, especially doing some really interesting analysis with age and gender. Uh, how those demographics are shifting, what used to be, uh, I mentioned Isaac Walton, it's the proper gentleman, it is the boys club, uh, that is starting to change in Canada and we're seeing more female anglers and we're seeing more young people get involved. So how that is leading to changes in uh, management. And this is the one I find really fascinating. This is a document out of Australia. And the Aussies have done something that a lot of developing countries haven't been able to do. They've established a national recreational fishing code of practice. Now this isn't binding legislation. It's more of a guideline for changing local rules and regulations regarding fishing. And the really unique thing about this, it's been around since the, the mid nineties, but it's updated every year, uh, or might be every couple of years, uh, is it includes culture. So one of the examples to come out of Australia uh, is around crayfish uh, and what we would call a spiny lobster. But crayfish populations, uh, I don't remember what state, were beginning to decline. And after careful stock assessments, they determined that it's um, tree divers that were primarily impacting the populations. What this document did was recommend a bit of a social analysis. How important is free diving to the culture? And the answer is very. Uh, that is an ingrained part of these communities is that you go free diving for your food. It's not just a way of putting food on the table or a quick way to get healthy or get active. It is a deeply ingrained cultural and social norm. So rather than just eliminating all free diving and making it illegal or uh, changing bag limits, because they were already, I believe, down to one per person per day, uh, the local government instead started first with a campaign to harvest urchin, which were becoming hyper abundant and really destroying a lot of kelp forest, realizing that there is no way you can stop people from free diving. It is too deeply ingrained and we need to work in a way with anglers to change a culture towards productive uh, and long-term sustainability and not just quick band-aid solutions. So that's a really fascinating one. And I think if you fish in Nova Scotia, you would probably agree that there is a deeply held culture of recreational angling in this province as well. And I, I'd say probably all across Canada. Uh, the example I use for that is I will go fishing in Halifax Harbor quite frequently for mackerel uh, to use a striper bait or to I'll eat some of them. And there's a gentleman who always fishes next to me. He's an older guy. Uh, and one day I remember him telling me, oh, by the way, Thomas, remember, each fish needs to be over six inches long in order to legally keep it. To which I said, well, it's actually 10 inches. Um, you know, I checked the regs before I came out, uh, and he responded to that with, well, I've been fishing here since 1972, and if the government thinks they can tell me what to do, they got another thing coming. So these are the sorts of things that I find fascinating, 
and the barriers we need to overcome in order to actually actively manage recreational fisheries. It's not just about stock assessments. It's actually a very uh, deep-rooted culture. And yeah, I'm probably quite a bit over time. I definitely had more to say about that. Uh, but with that in mind, I'm going to do a quick shameless plug. Uh, speaking of learning more for, from anglers, if you fish, we'd love to hear from you. One of the projects I'm working on is getting some baseline data for anglers across Nova Scotia, and we're particularly looking at attitudes and behaviors as a regard uh, invasive species. So I realize I threw a lot of things out there very quickly. I would say, does anyone have any questions? But a better way of phrasing it might be, does anyone have a retort? disagreements or things that you don't like that I said because a lot of it was my opinion. <laughs> Nick, unmute yourself. Oh, David has something in the chat. Can you read that, Thomas? I probably can. Let me just grab my mouse. Sorry, I'm just trying to exit. Yeah, all good. Right there. Two things in the chat. Yeah. Uh, completely agree with you there, David. Uh, for those who can't read the chat, uh, it's my impression that in Nova Scotia, brook trout are generally overfished, and there's some tension between sport fishers and meat fishers, uh, and the latter being responsible for overfishing. So sport fishing is more significant economically, the meat fishers are more significant for the stocks. Yeah, uh, very true. Uh, and many recent immigrants are fishing for food. That's, yeah, absolutely true. Uh, new Canadians are making up a growing proportion of anglers in the province. Uh, another reason uh, for the survey, we oftentimes think that anglers are men over 60 fly fishing. Uh, that's not the case. There are very wide demographics that are getting involved. Uh, and yeah, the sport fishing versus meat fishing is an ethical debate as much as a scientific one. So. I'm not sure that I can I can properly answer that. That might be a question if anyone has for the group. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Thomas. Your presentation was great. Um, I'm so sorry you didn't get to play the video. Uh, if you want to, we can put a link that. here. In the, um, There's also Aaron has something in the chat there as well. Um, oh, Aaron, Dan, how you doing, Aaron? <laughs> Uh, so Aaron just asked uh, if I've come across uh, Vivian Nguyen. I'm really bad at saying that last name. I know it's one of the most common ones in the world. Uh, I haven't, but Aaron, I believe you've actually shown it to me. Uh, but yes, attitudes and perspectives of BC fishers. So I have to make a note to really delve into that one. That might have, might have come by the abstract. Mm. So you don't have to use the um, comment section. Feel free to come off mute. Yeah, if anyone wants to turn their microphone on, we can just have a chat. I personally, my background is not in fishing. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Thomas, if like, like, why do you think uh, Nova Scotians reported such low numbers at 5% of recreational fisheries in comparison to the rest? Do you think that's like a mistrust thing that they might have underrepresented our numbers or that it really is different? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I believe that data comes from fishing licenses. So, um, and you don't need a license in Nova Scotia to fish in the ocean. So it's probably quite a few more people that go out uh, to catch mackerel and sea bass, uh, which you can do legally without no a license. That might be one reason. But yeah. other than that, I'm, I'm not, uh, not fully sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, David. David said great presentation. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, Sorry, I have a couple of questions. Thank you uh, very much for that interesting presentation. Remember, Nick, you're presenting uh, soon, so depending on how hard they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll expect some very interesting questions next week from you, Thomas. Um, I thought it was interesting, like what you were saying, the kind of proportional impact of recreational fishers on like certain populations. They were kind of targeting, you know, uh, large females, for example. Mm -hmm. And then kind of coupling that with the kind of that story you had about kind of the anger at regulations for um, recreational fishing, like, are there resources that you know out there that are made to kind of 
make sure that recreational fishers understand that type of impact that they might be having? Like a lot of the, you know, it's, I just think of a lot of the people I know who fish a lot and really the kind of, I think general assumption is that it's basically not having any impact because you think of commercial fisheries as just such large numbers and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, and that's one of the big things to get over. It's a little bit more obvious when you talk about uh, like the earlier comment. Uh, yeah, from um, David, uh, because we don't have a commercial brook trout fishery. So, and when you start talking about when you can literally see pools, it's a little bit easier to get that across because uh, you're quite literally watching fish get ready to spawn and a couple of feet of water. So if you have a couple of people releasing fish and a couple of people not releasing fish, uh, as David brought up, you're going to see some tensions on watersheds. And it's more difficult to do that with something that you have to, on the West Coast, for example, um, our striped bass population, which is really hard to sort of judge what the return is going to be. Obviously, we have DFO stock assessments that do uh, a pretty thorough job, but when you're fishing for a species that's just moving up the coast and it's not a resident population and it's not confined to a single river or watershed, it's actually moving hundreds of miles. Um, that's a whole nother ball game. So there's all sorts of NGOs working on this, governments working on this to how to think about angling uh, in a more sustainable lens. Uh, MTRI being a good example, uh, another shameless plug, but yeah, there's also uh, watershed societies for freshwater fishing are really big a, a good, and a great way of getting lots of people all together um, and sort of streamlining thoughts. Oh, you had a couple minutes. It was a very good presentation. Very interesting. Did you have a follow-up question, Nick? Did you have anything else? No. I have a question. Jane here. Awesome. Oh, hi, Jane. Didn't know you were on the call. Yeah, this 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 four of us actually we've got you on the big screen at MTR. Oh, yeah, sure. you're like a movie star here. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I was just the the data card that anglers are asked to fill in, yep. it, and the fact that there's such a low percentage of response. This seems a like a huge missed opportunity. How is that something that happens in other jurisdictions? And has there been any kind of conversation about how they could? Um, police that more or make it more effective to to actually get that data because it's, it's yeah yeah um, I think there's pretty much no jurisdiction in Canada where mandatory catch cards are, are really actually enforced uh, and if you uh, if you look at the, the 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 numbers that you need to make sort of an accurate data set about where people are fishing and how successful they are in those areas you don't need a huge sample size to do that. Uh, the good, the thing to think about though is, is those cards aren't a good representation of poaching, for example. Uh, people, there, there's no way to really meaningfully follow up with if what they're saying is true. So you're, you're counting on, uh, so I, I, I'm rambling a bit, but they are a good source of ecological data, even with a small sample size. But as far as people adhering to the rules, or people fishing out of season. Uh, I, I can't imagine the scenario where they really work uh, in that regard. And uh, I, I, I don't know of any attempts to increase the numbers except for uh, more calls encouraging people to do so. I've, I've been at uh, fish society meetings where uh, one of the first things to get said is also remember everyone send this in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I guess Creel census is do that, you know, get or another way of sampling for that. Um, that because there's there's no guarantee as well that the data cards would be true. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, enforcement, uh, I don't think they take their direction from the, the catch report cards. Uh, if a conservation officer is coming by, it, it, it's a very different kind of conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I do have a question, Thomas. Hey. <laughs> hey, Aaron. <laughs> hey. Um, yeah, those uh, cards, are um, are they mail-in only, or is there um, some way to put them online, or do you think that the demographic 
of fisher recreational fishers would go for the online depending <laughs> yeah it is available online and um and they, they give you a mail-in ballot when you buy it uh mail-in report card uh, when you buy your license but uh, there's an option to do it online i uh the last two years i've lost my card and submitted it online <laughs> yeah. i can't be trusted with a piece of paper for a full season <laughs> But yeah, demographics are, uh, as far as following up with anglers, is a, is a really interesting conversation because, as I mentioned, we kind of have two extremes growing, a, a new generation of young anglers uh, and older generation. And anecdotally, the older generations are much better organized and they speak a lot more in unison. They belong to river societies. They belong... Uh, you know, to fishing clubs, they go to fishing conventions, and you're not seeing that with the under 30 crowd. So how to engage younger people with conversations about fishing is, is an interesting question. There's also, there's a crossover between, you mentioned like younger fishers are also doing more of the farm to table thing of fishing, doing meat fishing. And as David mentioned, that's the um, what's actually depleting a lot of the stock, whereas the older demographic might be harder to reach, better organized, but they're doing more fit, like sport fishing, and might be um, more sort of like anti-working with the government or whatever, but what they're doing yeah. isn't actually depleting the stock as much as someone younger, more woke, but who's yeah. fishing for <laughs> food and therefore is having a bigger impact on the overall population, right? So how do you yeah. bring all those... Just before we make it sound like one side is completely in the right and the meat fishers are in the wrong, uh, one of the arguments I hear a lot from younger anglers is, uh, well, we don't have a uh, paintball hunting season, right? Uh, why are you, are you actually doing something better if you drag a fish out of the water and then put it right back in? Uh, isn't it more ethical to catch and then uh, keep? Uh, so. It, it is a it is nuanced, and there are arguments on each side. Yeah, yeah. If you just look at it from the ethics of an in individual angler, uh, that's one thing. And if you look at the ethics of conserving the stock, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely all. I mean, I can. I you're trying to be as empathetic as possible, right? Like you're, mm -hmm. and it really is on a personal level. So, um, really interesting. Um, I'm doing for anybody who's on the call. I'm doing outreach for uh, Thomas's survey. If you have any ideas for groups or people that might like to answer it, or where uh, the places that it should be circulated, we're looking to get information from uh, all types of fishermen um, on their their fishing habits uh, through the survey. So, um, yeah, please uh, send me an email if you have a contact. If you'd like the survey, it's also on our Facebook page. Um, and I just uh, put it as a link in the comments because I saw Chad was asking uh, where to get access to it. There There's a link right there. Perfect. By all means, please forward to friends. Uh, you don't need to be, we're trying to get a broad spectrum of anglers too. So don't think that you need to be uh, serious about it. You don't need to go fishing four times uh, a month. If you throw a rod in the water, uh, like to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a little complaint, Thomas. Oh, please. I, I don't like you talking about the older demographic being 49 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't upset you. You're only 35. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, is Jane going to say something controversial? No, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when your boss says that she has a complaint, tackles <laughs> 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 up. Yeah, Jane is forever 25. <laughs> Okay. Um, does anyone else have any last questions, things, Thomas? Any last last words? Shall we shall we wrap it up? Five PM. Happy hour, everybody. <laughs> I'm back to isolation, so thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> lovely to see your face. Okay. Uh, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there's any if there's no final words, then we'll uh, we'll cut it off for now. Thanks, yes, thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for listening. Um, come to Nick's talk next week, where we'll be talking about uh, the Species at Risk Act and legislature. So, um, all right. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye.